Good afternoon, everyone, and a special hello to those who are uh, online and to everyone on the phone. The scientific community, the business community, and the policy world have spent decades studying greenhouse gas pollution and climate change. Scientists in the United States and around the world have tracked in the last century, and in particular in the last three decades, alarming increases in the amount of greenhouse gases in our skies. That increase is deteriorating the natural balance in our atmosphere and changing our climate. There have and will continue to be debates about how and how quickly climate change will happen if we fail to act. But the overwhelming amount of scientific studies show that the threat is real, as does the evidence before our very eyes. Polar ice caps crumbling into the oceans, changing migratory patterns of animals and broader ranges for deadly diseases, historic droughts, more powerful storms, and disappearing coastlines. After decades of this mounting evidence, climate change has now become a household issue. Parents across the United States and around the world are concerned for their children and grandchildren. Governments are investing billions in adaptation strategies. Bill businesses are investing billions in efforts to cut greenhouse gases. Military planners are projecting new hotspots of instability and conflict. They know that if we do not act to reduce greenhouse gases, the planet we leave to the next generation will be a very different place than the one we know today. In 2007, the United States Supreme Court handed down perhaps the most significant decision ever reached in environmental law. The court ruled that the Clean Air Act, the landmark 1970 law aimed at protecting our air, is written to include greenhouse gas pollution. That verdict echoed what many scientists, policymakers, and concerned citizens have said for years. There are no more excuses for delay. Regrettably, there was continued delay. But this administration will not ignore science or the law any longer, nor will we avoid the responsibility we owe to our children and our grandchildren. Today, I'm proud to announce that EPA has finalized its endangerment finding on greenhouse gas pollution and is now authorized and obligated to make reasonable efforts to reduce greenhouse pollutants under the Clean Air Act. This long overdue finding cements 2009's place in history as the year when the United States government began seriously addressing the challenge of greenhouse gas pollution and seizing the opportunity of clean energy reform. In less than 11 months, we have done more to promote clean energy and prevent climate change than happened in the last eight years. Earlier this year, EPA established this country's first and what I believe will be a world-leading nationwide greenhouse gas emissions reporting system. Next month, large emitters in the United States will begin working with EPA to monitor their emissions. Beginning in 2011, large emitters will, for the first time, submit publicly available information that will allow us to meaningfully track greenhouse gas emissions over time. This reporting will also bring to light opportunities to jumpstart private investment in energy efficiency and new technologies and products, saving money improving bottom lines, and growing the economy. And it does all of this in a common sense way, without putting a burden on small businesses or other critical sectors of our economy. Through the Recovery Act and the support of strong clean energy reform legislation, President Obama has led the way in cutting greenhouse gas pollution and reducing our dangerous dependence on foreign oil, which threatens our national security and our economy. Today's endangerment finding provides the legal foundation for finalizing the recently proposed Clean Cars Program. That program was developed in collaboration with the American auto industry and other stakeholders and contains the nation's first ever limits on greenhouse gas emissions from American vehicles. And starting next spring, large emitting facilities will be required to incorporate the best available methods for controlling greenhouse gas emissions when they plan to construct or expand operations. These are reasonable, common sense steps that will allow us to do what the Clean Air Act does best, reduce emissions for better health, 
drive technology for a better economy, and protect the environment for a better future, all without placing an undue burden on the businesses that make up the better part of our economy. Today's announcement and these efforts are designed to complement comprehensive clean energy reform. We look forward to working with Congress to get a bill to the President's desk and to implementing that bill once it has been signed. We know that skeptics have and will continue to try to sow doubts about the science. It's no wonder that many people are confused. But raising doubts, even in the face of overwhelming evidence, is a tactic that has been used by defenders of the status quo for years. Those tactics have only served to delay and distract from the real work ahead, namely growing our clean energy economy and freeing ourselves from foreign oil that endangers our security and our economy. It's time that we let the science speak for itself. In making this finding, we relied on decades of sound, peer-reviewed, extensively evaluated scientific data. That data came from around the world and from our own U.S. scientists. Today's action is a step towards enduring pragmatic solutions to the enormous challenge of climate change. It is a step towards innovation, investment, and implementation of technologies that reduce harmful emissions. And it's a step towards green jobs, reduced dependence on foreign oil, and a better future for our children. It also means that we arrive at the climate talks in Copenhagen with a clear demonstration of our commitment to facing this global challenge. We hope that today's announcement serves as another incentive for far-reaching accords in our meetings this week. In taking action now and recognizing this threat now, we join the hundreds of other countries, thousands of leading scientists, tens of thousands of innovatives, innovators, entrepreneurs, and private companies, millions of Americans, and billions of global citizens who have seen the overwhelming evidence and called for action on climate change. Thank you. clarify that statement. And secondly, it's my understanding under the tailoring rule that uh, the EPA does not uh, exempt uh, or preempt state action, and many states have 100 to 250 ton limits uh, under the PSD and Title V provisions. Uh, will that mean that those states then can or must uh, regulate at that threshold? No, your question is a legal one, so I will not attempt to do the whole analysis here. What I will say about state action is that state action has been critical to getting us where we are so far. We've worked closely with states, and states are a key player as the legislative discussion continues. My point earlier was in making sure that the American people understand that we here at EPA believe that there are ways to sensibly move forward on regulation. So far, what we've done is primarily deregulatory. It's given assurances to small businesses and medium businesses that they would not be regulated, while giving a clear signal to larger emitters, emitters who burn over 131 uh, rail cars a year of coal, for example, that regulations can come under the Clean Air Act. Mr. Jackson, several congressional Republicans had asked that you delay today's announcement pending the investigation of the hacked emails controversy. Why didn't you delay it, and on what scientific basis have you moved ahead? I didn't delay it because there is uh, nothing in the hacked emails that uh, undermines the science upon which this decision is based. When you see the decision, and I hope you will review it, you'll see that the responses to comments include responses to questions about the underlying science, which are being raised again 
with respect to this particular issue. But this issue has not raised new scientific questions which aren't addressed already in this finding. So can you give us a couple bullet points of the science itself to kind of bolster your argument? Well, you know, I think the thing to talk about is the amount of science that's out there. United States scientists, many organizations even represented in this room have been studying this data for years. It's also important to understand, to contextualize those emails a little bit. You know, that's one thread of looking at one data set over many, many data sets and literally thousands of different threads of analyses, all of which reach the consensus that climate change is happening, that it's caused by man-made emissions. And then we look at that and look at the droughts, the flooding, the changes in diseases, the changes in migratory habits, the changes in our water cycle and climate that we now find affect human health and welfare. Yes, ma'am. Yes. Administrator Jackson, you said that next spring large emitting facilities will be required to incorporate the best available control technologies. Is that under the Clean Air Act or are you going to propose a new rule? EPA has already proposed a rule that says that large facilities, those that emit over 25,000 tons per year, would be subject to the BACT requirements under the Clean Air Act. The Clean Air Act sets out a simple premise, which is once you know you have pollution and once you know it's endangering human health and welfare, then EPA must act and it must compel facilities to use the best technologies out there. Now, it was pretty smart of people to realize that technology evolves over time. And my belief is that anything done in the future under the Clean Air Act, and we have not proposed what those technologies will look like, has to be done with an eye towards what's happening in Congress, but more importantly, the development of technology. We simply cannot make people implement a technology that does not yet exist under regulation. Yeah, the work that has to be done is that EPA would have to put out technical guidance to tell a facility what that would mean and then work with states, back to Ian's question, to implement those requirements. Administrator, you talked earlier, do you still believe that legislative solution is better than this? And if so, explain that. I absolutely do. I stand firm in my belief that legislation is the best way to move our economy forward on clean energy and to address climate pollution. The reason is because legislation is comprehensive. It can be economy-wide. It can move us in a – it can transition us, as the President has said. And it can give business absolute certainty that we are on the road to clean energy, that the investments that they want to make – either in retrofits or in technology development and demonstration and deployment will be profitable ones because they know that this country is on the road. That being said, I do not believe this is an either-or proposition. I actually see this as a both-and. I believe the Clean Air Act can complement legislative efforts, and in fact, the clean car rules that we propose is an excellent example of that. Hi, Robin Bravender with Greenwire. Um, several environmental groups have petitioned EPA to set national ambient air quality standards for uh, carbon dioxide and other greenhouse gases. I wonder uh, what your plans are with that petition and, and whether the endangerment finding now requires you to set an X for, for carbon dioxide. Now, nothing in today's action requires any regulatory action. That's an important distinction. Thanks, Robin. Um, and we will certainly review the petition and respond um, appropriately. I, I have never believed, and this agency has never believed, that setting a national ambient air quality standard for greenhouse gases was advisable. That being said, we need to look at the petition. Uh, I don't know that there's anything in there that would change my view, but we'll certainly do that. Well, today's action, again, is the basis for the CARS rule. You have to find endangerment in order to then be compelled, and it's not a choice, to act under the Clean Air Act. Further actions would certainly be warranted when we talk about a threat to public health and welfare. So uh, EPA continues its work on the regulatory front, and I want to emphasize again, I believe it's not either or. I don't want anyone to leave here thinking that because we continue our work, I don't stand firm in my belief that we need legislation. That being said, I also believe quite firmly that there are things that the Clean Air Act allow us to do 
clean cars, emissions reporting that we've already done um, that paved the way for this country to move smartly, sensibly, with common sense towards uh, a clean energy future. Uh, is, it, is it your intent um, that this endangerment finding will push members of Congress um, who are right now on the fence uh, to, to get onto your side and to work, uh, to work for a, a climate and energy bill? No, no. My intention here is to follow up on an almost uh, three-year-old requirement from the United States Supreme Court that EPA uh, address climate pollution, that it address greenhouse gases, that the Clean Air Act does, in fact, allow us to do so. And uh, as you know, this uh, draft endangerment finding has been worked on for years, predating the Obama administration. The other part of my attention, to be uh, quite frank, is to release the science that so many EPA employees worked on so diligently and I think so effectively uh, to reduce the questions in many people's minds to an answer about public health and welfare. This year, 2009, the United States government is saying once and for all that we are in uh, the clean energy and climate arena, that with respect to climate pollution, we will act. So the stationary sources will have to start reporting next year, is that right? January 1st. When will you start imposing rules, will you fast-track rules to make uh, stationary sources actually cut their emissions? What's the schedule for rules to cut their emissions? Yeah, I don't have a schedule for additional rules uh, with respect to the Clean Air Act for stationary sources. We have proposed a rule that talks about how we believe the Clean Air Act would apply to stationary sources. That's the so-called tailing rule Do you, you have a plan to fast-track these, these rules? No, no, no. We have a plan to continue working, and we will indeed – this is, this is certainly not an ending. We will continue to work under the Clean Air Act because that's what we must now legally do. With respect to this finding, we are compelled to address uh, greenhouse gas pollution. And just to follow up on that, um, you say you're, you want to complement what Congress is doing, but the Senate leadership has indicated they don't plan to get around to a vote on a climate change bill until early spring, which is late March, early April according to the calendar. So is it possible that EPA could issue these rules before they get around to voting on a climate change bill? Well, I, I certainly uh, have heard the uh, leadership in the Senate say that they do intend to move to those uh, uh, to legislation. We see very promising engagement by a number of senators. When, you know, for example, when they turn to those rules, they'll have the benefit of an emissions reporting inventory that's now set in rules that EPA uh, has already uh, adopted because we did that under different authority. Uh, no, this is not an either or. You know, I have not laid out a timeline, and certainly I respect. Uh, and, 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 and we'll uh, make sure that we are watching and working with Congress in their uh, legislative efforts. So they, they are independent in timeline. We don't have a timeline that looks at uh, the, the Senate, but I certainly hope to see them move quickly. Administrator, we have a couple of questions on the phone. Operator, if you could open up the line really quick so we can take uh, a couple of questions. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. So we need the best available technology. Okay, well, we'll on that. The vast body of scientific evidence not only remains unassailable, it's grown stronger. Uh, and it only points to one conclusion, that greenhouse gases from human activity are increasing at unprecedented rates and are affecting our environment and threatening our health. The findings I make today are firmly grounded in science that comes from independent lines of evidence, including by United States scientists. And all that work has been publicly commented on to varying degrees. And if you need one more uh, point of certainty, it's that uh, critics who have been opposing climate change and scientists who disagree whether they oppose climate change policy or not with scientific findings 
commented during the public comment period. EPA received almost 400,000 comments, and many of them were from scientists who brought up their scientific arguments. All of that material is in the record. All of it has been responded to in making this finding, and that's why I stand here certain that the science has been thoroughly evaluated, that the underlying scientists, both in those emails and the vast body that isn't addressed in any one of those emails, remains uh, the same. As I said, we have to continually look at the science. To what extent the, the information from uh, the CRU, uh, the underlying data, I mean? Well, the CRU underlying data, and, the, and the, first off, there's lots of data from the CRU, and then there is a data set that's now the subject to some of these, uh, e- the subject of some of these emails. But then there are several other data sets that have been evaluated by hundreds of scientists, um, and that, all that work is in thousands of different articles, all that have been peer reviewed. So you're talking about a tiny, one tiny thread out of thousands of thread of evidence and data and scientific information that lead me to stand here today confident that there was no reason to delay. And, in fact, we could move forward with work that we have been planning. Okay, we're going to try one last question from the phone. Are we ready on the phone? Your question comes from the line of Steve Power with the Wall Street Journal. Hi, Administrator. Thanks for doing this call. Um, I have a two-part question. Uh, I know you say that you are not putting out a timeline for next rules on emissions, but could you just give an idea of when do you think the earliest would be that the EPA could propose rules covering CO2 from existing power plants? And secondly, could you clarify why it is that you're issuing this rule now as opposed to doing it concurrent with the vehicle rule? Because I'm told that this is the first time EPA has issued an endangerment finding separate from the rule to actually regulate the pollutant. Yeah, uh, the answer to your first question is that no, I I have no additional information on timeline, Steve. Uh, And the second question is, yes, this is different. Uh, This was the subject. This finding itself was the subject of a U.S. Supreme Court case. There has been much written, and in fact, earlier this year, EPA released the endangerment finding that was uh, put together under the Bush administration, sent over to the White House and never opened. In my mind, in order to show the American people that EPA is on the job, is about doing its job. It was important for our credibility and for the trust of the American people to know that we would put this information out for public comment and act on it uh, in an expeditious fashion. We would keep the ball moving, and it's my hope that uh, the ball being moving as it moves to Congress, they'll keep pace on the ball, as I've uh, heard others say. Thank you very much, everyone. Thank you. Thanks, everybody. Thank you.